It is an em empirical fact that with any voluntary action that uses movement, the participation of the distal parts of the self, the hands, feet, head, and lips, is more clearly represented in the image of action than is the participation of the proximal parts, pelvis, chest, hip, joints, shoulder joints. This circumstance is applicable to relative conjugate movements and with some other approaches as well. Let us look at one example in which the idea of relative conjugate movement is applied. A man had difficulty in raising his right arm overhead. He complained of pain. The teacher invited him to lie down on a couch on his back. The teacher then gently took the man's right arm by the elbow and moved it overhead, only so far as it went easily, up to an obtuse angle between the chest and the upper arm. The next step was not to increase that angle by lowering the elbow to the couch, but instead for the practitioner to hold that elbow fixed in space with one hand and to lift the right shoulder blade slightly away from the couch with his other hand. Doing this repeatedly, the teacher might eventually sense that this movement was starting to get easier the teacher could then lower the shoulder blade towards the couch while lowering the elbow, which would thus become the new and easy way to act. One might repeat this process starting from the newly gained situation and thus achieve another small amount in the extension of the shoulder joint. That's from pages 14 and 15 of the short book called Corollary discharge, the forgotten link with the, the um, provocative subtitle, um, Remarks on the Body-Mind Problem by the late, great Johanan Ryerwant. Ryerwant? Ryerwant? Rant. Um, I, I'll probably stumble on the name a little bit um, with apologies, at least the surname. Um, and uh, this interesting little read was um, brought to my attention by Ava Laser. This is uh, Ava's website here. Um, a Feldenkrais practitioner uh, out of Sweden. Um, uh, so you can go to somatic s-o-m-a-t-i-k dot s-e and um, check out Ava's work, follow Ava's work. Um, and on that website is this um, homage to Yohanan, um, who uh, I never worked with directly, um, but whose writing I thought was um, extremely clear. Um, this book, The Feldenkrais Method, Teaching by Handling, is um, I think very useful to read. Um, it's easily the most concrete description of what functional integration is that I've seen. And I think because of that, um, a lot of people don't like it because um, it kind of implies more structure perhaps to Feldenkrais method than um, they would think is consistent with Feldenkrais method. Um, so people, reasonable people can disagree. However, I think it's an uh, excellent uh, attempt. Um, it has a foreword by Moshe himself, um, which uh, um, if you talk to Ava about the foreword to this book, uh, Ava has interesting insights from the context of um, the Jewish tradition that I wasn't um, as well connected to. Um, but the... Uh, I believe the term was a, a smata, um, um, a kind of um, um, like an endorsement of uh, a person, a, a learned elder or a respected person uh, that comes in the before book. So it gets sort of anglicized as a foreword, but the actual act that Moshe was um, 
um, making in writing this forward, I guess, um, is something a little bit closer to an endorsement. It's a very short forward. Um, this other book, Acquiring the Feldenkrais Profession, I do have the good fortune of having read before. Um, I don't know how I came across it, and I lost my copy of it, and it's out of print. Um, so that's too bad, because I thought it was a very um, clear read as well. Um, and uh, so, yeah, Ava's got this um, great page with all these... Uh, Right, yeah, here, here's the book Acquiring the Feldenkrais Pro Profession um, and uh, another, um, yeah, other, other useful writing, including this book, which you can, um, the one I just read from, um, that you can purchase from the website. Um, so that's how I got my copy of the book, Corollary Discharge, The Forgotten Link. And um, it isn't the kind of thing I would normally jump to read, frankly. Um, uh, I've gotten more interested in actually like physiological or like sort of naturalistic descriptions of what's happening in FI um more recently um because I, I think i think the actual description like the neurological description of like experience is starting to get more compelling um and and sort of maybe we're, we're starting to be well equipped to address some some of the interests of, of everyday experience um But I'll, I'll I'll read a little bit more from the book, just because the community might benefit from some structure around some of these ideas, and in the absence of structures which are consistent with the natural sciences and with the naturalistic worldview, people will reach for all other kinds of explanations and analogies and ways of explaining the phenomena that they're dealing with. So, so let's look at some of the some of the structure here. the The term corollary discharge comes from H. L. Tuber. Um, I guess introduced in the lecture "Brain and Conscious Experience" in nineteen sixty four, and Tuber was was introducing this idea to help explain the process of visual perception although maybe i'm being too narrow when i say i'm 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 trying to paraphrase here and that isn't literally what's said What's literally said is there is the subjective experience awareness. There is a subjective awareness of experiencing directions in space, left, right, above, and below. Moving the eyes or tilting the head leaves the perception of the space invariant. And then there is also the awareness of the space behind, the absent space. And so we have the ability to make maps and plans. So you're aware of the space around you, even if you're not directly encountering it. You you're you have a you have a map of space itself, which is different from your direct perception of space. Three aspects of spatial order are distinct and should be considered separately. The immediate perception of visual space, the mechanism of compensation 
for voluntary changes in posture and the level of representation of spatial relations not immediately given, as in those mapped things. So there's what you perceive, and then there's a second thing, which is how what you perceive is going to shift depending on, on your movement. The distinction of these aspects can be shown by considering their selective vulnerability to different cerebral lesions. Injury of the occipital lobes interferes with presentation. That's the initial perception, the, the actual where the optic nerve maps onto the cortex is, is the presentation, the actual raw, raw visual processing. Injury of the frontal lobes interferes with compensation. That's the interplay of the motor aspects and the visual system. And injury of the parietal lobes interferes with representation. And it cites page 183 of um, the, the statement about injury of the parietal lobes interferes with representation is from a, a looks like a monograph. Yeah, multi-author book. Um, alterations of perception after brain injury that Tober makes contributions to. So it's kind of Tober citing himself in a unpeer reviewed book is what's happening there actually. But um, parietal lobes interferes with representation. Well, let, let's be clear. Yohanan uh, is citing the page from Tober's book. Yeah. So, uh, So Tuber assumes that the compensation for head tilts or head movements has to be provided by a central mechanism. Any voluntary movement or change of posture involves simultaneously with the efferent discharges to the peripheral effectors, a central discharge from motor to sensory systems, the corollary discharge, preparing those sensory systems for the changes that will occur as a result of the intended movement. So the corollary, dis corollary discharge is what feeds back from the outgoing action activated motor system to give information about the um, the changes the so that the sensory system has a model for the anticipated changes so that deviations from the anticipated changes can be perceived because we're not interested in all the trivial side effects of the intended movement. It's only the unpredicted effects of the, un of the intended movement that our, our nervous system's um, going, to, uh, going to attune to. So it's kind of like a, it's a, as far as I can tell, this corollary discharge is um, is like a posited necessarily necessary communication that bridges from the the motor system back to the sensory system. And so that's that's I think that gives you the idea of the title, the link, the link between so-called body and mind is is coming from the the motor system communicating directly to the, the sensory system, somehow, um, uh, a statement of what's happening. And this is a, this is a great example. Uh, when I, when I started, when I started, uh, when I decided where to start reading from, um, this is definitely an alternative. Um, place, um, but the way the way it's worded, I find a, a little confusing. So, I mean, obviously, if you move your eyes left and right, then the information that's striking the retina is different, and and so you're you're definitely having movement occurring, 
that's being inputted into the the visual system. But the room doesn't appear to move around you when you move your eyes. That's very much not the experience. But then if you take your your finger and and slightly press on the eyeball from outside of of the oculomotor system, and you cause the eye to shift a little bit, then the, then then the the room does move. Then you do get a sense of, um, not that the eye is moving in space, but in a sense that space itself is moving. And so, uh, because the eye muscles aren't being used in that second example, um, then the you're removing the corollary discharge from the eye movement process. And then as a result, um, the, the perception of space itself is distorted. The visual scene jumps. This is an example, this is an example of to Tuber, um, Yohanan's citing from from that book as well, page one ninety eight. So this is related to outflow theory about the role of eye movements in perception. And there's a bunch of other names: Holston Middle State and R. W. Sperry around nineteen fifty. Tuber intended to give these notions the broadest possible meaning, so much so that the presence or absence of a corollary discharge would then serve as a physiological marker of whether a movement was voluntary or involuntary, self-produced or reflex. And so, yeah, there goes through some further examples. I'll just pick out a couple more fragments, usually the kind of thing that I don't like from clumsy readers, but um, obviously I can't read the whole book. Um, and uh, by connecting to some of the terms that you may have heard in other places, I think it'll be the most, um, it, will, it will help people understand whether or not they're interested in reading the whole book. Other neurophysiologists have used the term efference copy to refer to corollary, cor corollary discharge because together with the outgoing efferent impulses from motor centers to the peripheral effectors, the muscles, a copy of those impulses goes to the respective sensory brain centers so that the sensory consequences of the intended action are already anticipated. So that's another another more more physiologically explicit term is efference copy. One may sum up what Tuber wrote about the meaning of corollary discharges in their broadest possible sense. A, they enable the sensory centers in the brain to anticipate the consequences of self-produced actions. B, perceiving the invariance of the spatial order, order of perception is accomplished by a compensation compensating mechanism. C. Corollary discharges are learned by experience. D. Corollary discharges have a special role during the first few months of the individual's life. And finally, E. They determine by their presence or absence whether a movement is voluntary, intentional, or involuntary reflex. And as of the time of this book, which is 2008, it's it's not so long ago. Um, although, you know, Tuber's work's going stretching back to the 50s. Um, this paragraph is kind of political and maybe important to get out there. It is interesting to mention that contemporary neurophysiology largely ignores the notion of corollary, corollary discharge or efference copy. 
despite the fact that neural pathways that can assume these interconnections have been established in the brain, and despite the fact that those connections might indicate a way to clarify certain aspects of the body-mind issue. After all, you have here a controllable connection between sensation, perception, and intention. And so um, mentions citing from R.H.S. Carpenter's Phys Neurophysiology, uh, out of, published in 1990, um, the term of internal feedback. And so the idea is basically that that efference copy, that that um, internal model of what the um, what a particular movement pattern, uh, a, p a particular um, um, efferent efferent action, um, gets gets compared with the intended outcome, and then. In that way, the actual movements negotiated. Um, and then Walter Freeman and that's from a 2000 book, How Brains Make Up Their Minds, refers to the goal-directed actions that the brain constructs. The brain also primes the sensory cortex to select the sensory perceptions that are predicted as the consequences of the impeding action, impending actions. Central process he calls preafference, which is the basis for what we experience as attention and expectation. So attention is, is the experience of preafference, says Walter J. Freeman. Or at least a lot of what maybe maybe that's overstating it, but much of what we call um, attention and expectation. I feel I feel like I need to digest that a lot better. It seems it seems provocative, like ambitious, provocative. talking about the experience of intention or the experience of expectation. So I might look into that further. Um, the sensory cortexes can thus predict how the performed actions might change the relation of our senses to the world. The messages are the above mentioned corollary discharges. But this is in the context of preafference. The somatosensory cortex also receives messages from the muscles and joints, which confirm whether an intended action has been performed. The feedback process called proprioception, as well as interoception, coming from the internal organs, and exteroception, coming from the world, connect my brain and body, whereas preafference resides entirely within the brain. Preafference enables us to imagine what things may be like if or when they come. Hmm. Hmm. I'm setting page numbers in that book. From 2000. W.J. Freeman. So, yeah, it would be nice to have some um, people with. Uh, actual 
neurophysiology nerd, nerd rank, uh, comment on any of this, um, how current it is. Um, but the basic idea seems like it's not, not really worth debating. Actually, the, the structures are there. And the process seems necessary, especially with the, there's just increasingly, I, I think this Bayesian brain picture works. The idea that um, so much decision-making comes down to comparing what is being observed against a model of what's most likely to happen. So making this model of what's going to happen is um, it's uh, essential. Um, so then in chapter three, uh, the the books, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Yohanan covers um, the idea of relative conjugate movements in Feldenkrais method. And there's some really specific insights um, about how relative conjugate movements um, fulfill one way for um, helping people increase their adaptability in the context of intentional movement, which is which is one one narrow one somewhat narrow way of describing what the, the goals of somatic education might be. Um, sure, helping people do specific things, absolutely. But the general recipe for helping people improve their sense of adaptability, that's a, a larger, larger offer. And that's the the section I read um, at the start of start of the session today. Um, I think I'll just read that that same section again. It's the end of the chapter, pages fourteen and fifteen. It is an empirical fact that with any voluntary action that uses movement, the participation of the distal parts of the self, hands, feet head and lips, is more clearly represented in the image of action than is the participation of the proximal parts, pelvis, chest, hip, hip joints, shoulder joints. This circumstance is applicable to relative conjugate movements and with some other approaches as well. Let us look at one example in which the idea of relative conjugate movement is applied. A man has difficulty in raising his right arm overhead. He complained of pain. The teacher invited him to lie down on the couch on his back. The teacher then gently took the right man's right arm by the elbow and moved it overhead, only so far as it went easily, up to an obtuse angle between the chest and the upper arm. The next step was not to increase that angle by lowering the arm, the arm, the elbow to the couch, but instead for the practitioner to hold that elbow fixed in space with one hand and to lift the right shoulder blade slightly away from the couch with his other hand. That's that conjugate movement of the shoulder blade. Doing this repeatedly, the teacher might eventually sense that this movement was starting to get easier. The teacher could then lower the shoulder blade towards the couch while lowering the elbow which would thus become the new and easy way to act. And, and, and it's Yohanan's suggesting that the teacher offers 
the new the new coordination in the act of lowering working with gravity the easier act one might repeat this process starting from the newly gained situation and thus achieve another small amount in the extension of the shoulder joint so sort of an fi an fi um, strategy a feldenkrais method strategy which you can see diffusing into all kinds of different areas of um, um, bodywork. Chapter four is titled Habitual and Non-Habitual Patterns of Action. And so jumping to the middle of this chapter on page 19, we can now return to the idea stated at the beginning of this chapter about changing a non-habitual pattern of action into a habitual one. All learning by the brain amounts, in the end, to the formation of physical connections between neurons in such a way as to represent the associations that exist in the real world. Memory thus represents the world within our, our brain. He then goes through some of the specifics of how the brain is known to change its structures. I don't believe the word neuroplasticity appears in the book because there's no reason for gobbledygook. So specifically, the the integration of the corollary discharge into the the image of the action itself is is proposed to be this this key thing for changing um, a non habitual action into a habitual one. Yeah, and some some examples. And another short chapter follows with some some more everyday examples of corollary discharge. The example of voluntarily uh, manipulating objects with the hands. Um, monitoring speech in dialogue. Um, revisits the question of visual perception, um, the output of a musical instrument. Chapter six has an interesting title, The Self's Boundaries. Um, so elaborating from this example of reaching out for an object to touch it, Touching our own body creates for us the image of self, which is different from the rest of the world. We know consciously this is me and that is not me. The boundary between the self and the outside world is clearly set. 
I wonder. A little child, while touching places on his or her own body, learns this that kind of distinction very early. The child's thinking translated, as it were, into some rational language could go this way. This is a toy. I can play with it, and I can throw it away. But this is me. Mummy is here and there. But this is me at the center of all interest. <laughs> I find this chapter subtle. I'm I'm not uh, capable of summarizing it very well. It's basically, I think, this idea that the self-image is a sensory. It's it's a result of sensory motor activity. We have to read that more. Chapter 7, Impairment and Rehabilitation. This is uh, one, of, one of the longer chapters. And yeah, just offering this educational approach to improving function in the context of injury or rehabilitation, this, this therapeutic application of somatic education. And basically the idea that relearning control over over areas that are in spasm or in, or in chronic contracture um, by breaking up the experience of that rigidity and offering small, voluntary, safe, comfortable movements. Nothing nothing unusual. Even even repeats the example of the flattest from Feldenkrais method, teaching by handling. That's uh, in the end of that book. Um, although a particular detail of the, the rehabil a stage in the rehabilitation where um, the, the control of the fingers is so poor that the fingertips can't even be directed over the flute, over the, the holes on the flute. And, and so the, the middles of the fingers are being used and the sound feedback is horrible. And Johanan sees the flat as being distressed by the horrible sound and emphasizes that because he can't see where his fingers are going when he's in playing position. The fingers are kind of foreshortened and obscured by the flute itself. Um, that that sound was the feedback he needed for, for improving. So, so if I remember right, um, 
Right. The auditory sense provided it an alternative channel of feedback for the motor functions of the fingers. So this is a, an example of um, corollary discharge um, not being like really mediated by neurological structures directly, but it's the it's the sound produced by this instrument is is creating corollary discharge. Um, so that's a useful example, I think, for for broadening away from the idea of just um, efferent copy. Efferent's copy, yeah. And there's another example that's not the flattest that maybe I'll, I'll read this little passage. A woman in her 30s had undergone surgery on her lumbar spine for removal of a tumor and was left with a paralyzed left leg. She had to use a crutch in walking. Sitting with straight legs, she could move voluntarily neither her left ankle joint nor the toes of her left foot. When I tried to move those toes gently, she succeeded at moving them by herself, but only while looking at them. It turned out here that the respective sensory fibers had been damaged, but not the motor ones. I advised her, of course, to do those movements while looking, to look away now and then, until the impaired kinesthetic sense could take over in monitoring and controlling the actions of her toes and ankle. Hopefully that worked out. Probably it did. And then that's the book. Chapter 8 is Conclusion. The Mind-Body Link Reconsidered. Well, mentions he references back to the preface. I'll read the preface. It's only a paragraph. I'll read a verbatim first. On page Roman numeral nine. This monograph addresses the lay reader about certain aspects of the human brain's functioning that are involved in learning, habituation, control of actions, and eventually rehabilitation. I'm not intending to present here a learned, learned scientific article or paper, but to bring, rather to bring into focus a continuously occurring event or activity within our brain called corollary, corollary discharge that usually accompanies intentional actions. There will be a few con conclusions as well, some in matters of principle, like certain understandings concerning the mind-body gap, and some of a practical nature. The mind-body gap. The, the la latter will draw attention towards some everyday activities seen in this context and also presents insights and experiences attained in the framework of the Feldenkrais method, which addresses people, either through verbal advice or through gentle manipulation, with the purpose of enhancing their adaptation to limiting or adverse circumstances. The method attempts to achieve this by increasing the awareness of their self-produced actions and expanding their self-images so that they might include alternative options for, acts, for acting. All right, well, yeah, certain, certain understandings concerning the mind-body gap is the thing I guess he was calling back to. Returning to the issue of the psychophysical gap. Ugh. I hate that language. That was mentioned in the preface. I can sum up a few ideas. It is difficult to form an opinion or to assume a philosophical stance in the question of the gap between mind and body, be it reductionism or dualism, for example. Given the antithetical discussions that are going on among neurophysiologists and philosophers, 
On the other hand, in any learning process and in any monitoring of intentional actions, the physical part and the mental part, sensation and perception, doing and thinking, emerge together. Sometimes even the question of which causes which has no meaning, and both parts appear to be just two aspects of the same occurrence, like two sides of the same coin. Two aspects of the same phenomena is where he's going to land at talking about David David Bame's analogy for other non-dual realities. The monitoring of one's own intentional actions is an activity amenable to everyone's introspection. The corollary discharges that come with intentional actions and the changes that occur with these cor corollary discharges during the adaptation and habituation of the respective actions pre present a detailed and perhaps easily analyzable connection between sensation and perception. Talks a little bit about consciousness, what that is specifically in relation to things like sensation or motor activity. The Feldenkrais method, as I tried to show, makes ample use of the notion of image of action and of the relevant sensory anticipations by relating to the corollary discharges in question. The method and its practical application, already practiced by a great number of teachers, practitioners of the method, as it were, just invites some further elucidation in scientific terms of the body-mind issue, as well as, for example, the issue of free will and the issue of interpersonal communication. And then the last paragraph, we have a quite similar situation in quantum theory where subatomic objects, electrons for example, behave more like waves or more like particles as their behavior is actualized in different experimental arrangements. One considers this wave-particle duality valid, despite the fact that there is some difficulty in grasping this intuitively. We can look at the body-mind gap in the same way. The event in question behaves body-like or mind-like depending on the specific arrangement or observation we might be interested to follow. Sates, Bames, 1983, Bork, Wholeness and the Implicate Order, Carpenter's, 1990, Physiology, um, Crick and Koch, 1992, have an article called The Problem of Consciousness in Scientific American, which I think is his example of the reductionist position that consciousness is like a physiological function of the brain. And uh, so that that's a, that's a, more brought up as something, as an example, something he disagrees with. Um, Freeman, 2000, How Brains Make Up Their Minds. Um, I'm interested in learning more about W.J. Freeman's book. Um, the 1966 book by, no, sorry, chapter by Tuber um, in Brains and Conscious Experience. And Ryerwantz, Own the Feldenkrais Method Teaching by Handling, chapter 12. Nice little book. I think uh, one of my pages here has an image of the guy. Yeah, from Al, Al Wadley's website. There's a little bio here with an image of 
Yohanan. And I'll read from the back of this corollary discharge book. Again, that I got from Ava Laser Somatic, S O M A T I K dot S E. Um, Yohanan Ryberwan, born 1922, was one of the main assistants of Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais in 52. Yohanan, then a physics professor in the secondary school, joined the ATM lessons given by Feldenkrais in Tel Aviv and continued to participate in them once a week for 15 years. Yohanan was one of the participants in the first professional training given by Feldenkrais starting in 1969. For 15 years from 1970, Yohanan worked in the same room with Feldenkrais as his assistant at the Feldenkrais Institute in Tel Aviv. He was also one of the invited assistants at the trainings given by Moshe in San Francisco, California, and Amherst, Massachusetts. Since then, he has worked extensively as a trainer for professional trainings in the USA, Canada, Europe, and Israel. His book, The Feldenkrais Method, Teaching by Handling, appeared in English in 1983 and has been translated into Spanish, German, Italian, and Hebrew. It's interesting, all these really clear written materials by Yohanan Ryerwant, Ryerrat, Ryerrat, and, and, uh, um, I don't know of North American trainings that, uh, use them. Um, so that's interesting. Having, having done a North American training, uh, mine was with Elizabeth Berenger in, in San Diego. Um, It's not like I learned anything, I think, that contradicts what Yohanan would say. Um, there is, there is like, the, there is, like, the, the, the thing that I always, always thought it was interesting that the, in that book, Teaching by Handling, the um, first... The first FI that he demonstrates, um, the first manipulon, the first act, it's his, his jargon for a communication act in a Feldenkrais lesson, in, a, in an FI, um, is assessing how you, the the teacher the teacher sits at the head of the student who's lying I think on the side in the very first lesson, and and takes the the skull more or less and and pulls it towards them to get a sense of the connection along the length of the spine. And um, I may not be paraphrasing it well, um, but it's a it's a it's communication that involves more or less touching the head of the student right away and, and even transmitting force through the neck and spine, even if it's supposed to be a very small amount of force. And um, um, that always struck me as, wow, like, especially for trainees, I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage like new, new Feld Feldenkrais practitioners to start off by pulling on heads on anyone <laughs> um if only that you know establishing safe safe rapport establishing um the the mode of communication and the goals um as mostly being um well yeah as entirely being um non-threatening uh feel like like a lot of people would be more protective would brace more if they felt their head being mobilized that way <laughs>
but yeah, that's just that's just me. That's just my instincts. Um, but yeah, like even that doesn't contradict anything in particular. It's not like the instructions are to do it rudely in a way that makes the student <laughs> feel like they're being uh, dragged in a particular way aggressively. So yeah. Thank you, Ava Laser, for your work, for offering this book to the community. Um, for all the other things, um, lots of actual scholarship. Um, here's an interesting article that Eva posts from Yohanan. This was published in the Feldenkrais Journal. Um, I guess it's uploaded somewhere. Yeah. Here it is. Envis envisaging the future of the Feldenkrais Method, published in 2003. And it starts off by saying, the future of the Feldenkrais method lies not only in aiming at a steadily increasing number of practitioners, but also in increasing actively the quality of those practitioners. Moshe Feldenkrais himself has been very keen in asserting that his method is not to be considered another kind of physiotherapy or movement training. He was ridiculing the opinion of some people that considered his system as a kind of bodywork. He strongly believed that people can learn to have better control over their actions and hence be healthier. It had to start with clarifying certain ways the brain perceives and acts and seeing the movements of the body as expressing processes within the central nervous system. That's just an excerpt from the start of that article, which you can read for yourself off that website. Well, I think that's where I'm going to stop this particular live stream um, for today. Um, not sure I'll do more today, but continuing every Thursday in this time slot, I work with movement organizing, trying to take the ideas of somatic education and look at them from the context of the actual community, the actual set of relationships that are propagating these institutions in the world that are trying to communicate with people the value of pursuing these kinds of practices um, and all the various ways that this is not going well, um, that we're not being effective. Um, in actually advocating for the vision of somatic education that people like like Moshe Feldenkrais had versus um, simply following the market and uh, whatever appears to be the latest trends in uh, alternative medicine and such. Uh, so uh, why is it that Feldenkrais method um, isn't associated with uh, actual liberation of individuals? Why isn't it associated with people um, everywhere improving the conditions of themselves around themselves? It's because 
simply improving neuromuscular organization is is a starting point of a process that can involve all kinds of adaptive changes in the organization of one's soma all and including the relations between them and their their neighbors their families neighbors and families including the non-human actors as well and so realizing soma and thomas hannah's connotation of our experience on the tree of life how can we actually sustain that situation for ourselves and for others trying to move somatic education in that direction is the goal of these thursday live streams so see you next week for more of this or earlier in the week tuesdays and wednesdays i do more conventional learning or review in the natural sciences, stuff outside of my actual work as a Feldenkrais practitioner, but stuff that I'm interested in reevaluating myself as I learn to attend to myself better as I go through these materials and ideas. As always, you can connect with me, Ryan Hoffman, at Somatica, and thanks for your time. See you next Tuesday.